Hi, I'm John Bradshaw from It Is Written, and I have the privilege of sharing with you today about, about practically the most important thing that we could be talking about, and that is evangelism. There are few things in this world more important than evangelism. And when it comes to the life of the church, there is nothing more important that we could be doing. God called the church into existence so that we could share Jesus with others. Yet when we think of evangelism, the very thing God has called us to himself to carry out, sometimes we tend to get intimidated and fearful and we wonder, we, we even wonder if it works anymore. Well, let's talk this through today. Together we're going to discuss some really important principles and you'll discover some things that will make sharing your faith in Jesus with others much more effective and much more enjoyable than it has ever been. So we start with an important question, and that is this, where do we begin? You might be wondering, where do I start? I want to share my faith in Jesus with others. So how do I go about doing that? Well, it's important to understand how evangelism actually works. And I think that generally speaking, over the last few decades, we've become the victims of our own success particularly if you back up a little bit. If you have a memory that goes back, it used to be that when it came to evangelism, we called the evangelist, he came to town, erected a tent or rented a hall, mailed out handbills. The people came, they heard, they were convinced, they were baptized, and that was good. Except that it taught us that all we needed to do was sit on our hands and wait for the evangelist to come and rely on the evangelist to do the work, and expect the pastor to do the other work involved. We as spectators looked on from the sideline and said, hey, this evangelism thing is really easy. Well, times have changed. Evangelism still works, but as a blessing from God to us, we are now beginning to realize that evangelism works. It takes work. It takes effort. It takes patience. It takes planning. It takes strategizing. It takes It takes a bit of our time, and that's okay, because we couldn't spend our time on anything more worthy than evangelism. Now, I say evangelism, and you think maybe the public meeting. Four weeks, five weeks, a hall, attendance, appeals. Okay, that's okay, except public evangelism is only part of the whole of evangelism. I'll say that again. Public evangelism is not the sum total of evangelism. It's part of evangelism. It's part of a a process of evangelism. And we shall refer to that as the evangelism cycle. When we start to understand the cyclical nature of evangelism, or should I say the cyclical nature of the evangelism cycle, we start to get our heads around, our arms around, our minds around how evangelism can be truly successful. And there's something we want for you, it is written, we want for you to experience success in sharing Jesus with others. There's a few things I could say, and one of them would be this. Not everybody you share Jesus with is going to be interested. That's just true. But should that put you off? No, it should not. If that person selling insurance was put off by the fact that not everybody was going to say yes to her or to him, they quit and we likely wouldn't own insurance. We just know that in many businesses, no thank you is part of the equation. And in the business of sharing Jesus with others, we're going to hear some no thank yous. But that's okay. When the gold miners rushed to California in the late 1840s, they knew that as they chipped away to the side of mountains and washed away yards and yards of earth and dug and poked and scraped and scratched and suffered and and sacrificed, they knew there'd be a lot of useless rock. But they kept on searching for gold because it would be worth it when they found that precious gold. Lives could change in a moment when somebody found that glimmering, gleaming, glistering good yellow stuff. Lives change when you find somebody who is looking for Jesus. And you might have to go through some rock to get there. Uh, it might not always happen on the first try. You may feel like, I don't, I don't 
really think I'm making any progress, when in actual fact, you are. The gold miner kept searching, kept digging, and found gold. If we'll keep searching, and if we'll keep digging, and if we'll put some effort into this, there is no question at all that we will find the gold. And as I said, at it is written, that's what we want you to experience. And you can. And that's the truth. Anyone can. Anyone can share Jesus successfully. Before I go further, let me share a story with you of a young fellow named Hosso. Hosso was a young man that I met in Mongolia during a recent It Is Written mission trip to Mongolia. And the reason I met him was uh, he had come to the church as a result of a previous It Is Written medical missionary uh, expedition to Mongolia. He connected with the church through the medical missionary outreach. He learned of Jesus in this country that's 97.5% not Christian. He learned of Jesus and he'd come to the church and his family followed him into the church. Now this young man, what's interesting about him is that he was tongue-tied. His tongue was connected to the base of his mouth, which meant that some of the things that you and I find very easy to do, he could not do. One of them was he could not talk. He needed surgery, relatively simple surgery actually, to disconnect his tongue from the bottom of his mouth. So one of our oral maxillofacial surgeons performed the surgery and his tongue was freed and now he's in therapy learning to talk. It's fantastic. So while we're doing this uh, interview with his family, the pastor mentioned to me that, oh yes, someone is being baptized tomorrow that Hosso brought into the church. And I thought about that. I said, well, that's curious. This brother, 21 years old, cannot speak. How did he bring somebody into the church? He said, somebody? He said, there are four families, four, four families in the church today because of Hosso's witness, because of the way he shared Jesus with others. I said, how does he do that? He can't speak. He can't say a word. And the pastor said, well, you know, I don't know, but he's just learned how to share his faith. And he's brought four families to faith in Jesus Christ. So if a tongue-tied young man who cannot speak or could not speak could bring four families to faith in Jesus Christ in a country that is overwhelmingly non-Christian, do you think, do you think the likes of me and you would be able to lead somebody to Jesus? We both know what the answer to that question is. So with hope in our hearts, with expectation in our hearts, we're going to dive into this thing and look at the evangelism cycle. Jesus believed in it. Jesus understood it. We shall look together at a parable. It's a well-known parable. It's found in Luke chapter 8. I shall start reading in verse 4. Hang in there with me because we'll read a fair few verses together. Luke 8 verse 4, the Bible says, And when much people were gathered together and were come to him out of every city, he spake by a parable. A sower went out to sow his seed. And as he sowed, some fell by the wayside, and it was trodden down, and the fowls of the air devoured it. And some fell upon a rock, and as soon as it was sprung up, it withered away because it lacked moisture. Luke 8 verse 7. And some fell among thorns, and the thorns sprang up with it and choked it. And other fell on good ground and sprang up and bare fruit an hundredfold. And when he had said these things, he cried, He that hath ears to hear, let him hear. And it's worth me mentioning here, not all the seed sprung up and bore fruit. That's just reality. And so we go back to this in Luke 8 and verse 9. And his disciples asked him, saying, What might this parable be? And he said, Unto you it is given to know the mysteries of the kingdom of God, but to others in parables, that seeing they might not see, and hearing they might not understand. We're at verse 11 now. Now the parable is this. The seed is the word of God. Verse 12. Those by the wayside are they that hear. Then cometh the devil 
and taketh away the word out of their hearts, that they should believe and be saved. Verse 13, they on the rock are they which when they hear, receive the word with joy. And these have no root, which for a while believe and in time of temptation fall away. And they which fell among thorns are they, which when they have heard go forth and are choked with cares and riches and pleasures of this life and bring no fruit to perfection. But that on the good ground are they which in an honest and good heart, having heard the word, keep it and bring forth fruit with patience. Now, according to the parable we just read, how should evangelism be carried out? Jesus made a few very important points there, didn't he? He stated, the seed is the word of God. Keep that in mind. Then he said that the sower, the farmer, that's the soul winner. In this context, that would be you and me. The farmer or soul winner needs to have a plan in order to get results. It's not often that you just walk out into your yard and say, My goodness, I have rows of corn and cabbages and tomatoes and beets and peas and beans just growing. They just sprang up. Doesn't happen very often. You know, if you've had to plant a garden, you had to do some planting, had to dig up the place. Even once you've planted the seeds in the ground, you've got to tend to them. You might have to add nutrients, food of some kind. You've got to keep pests away but you come at it with a plan. In farming, there's a plan, whether it's horticulture, whether you're raising cattle, you gotta have a plan. And Jesus was clear, there needs to be a plan if you want to experience good results. Now the traditional method, what is it? Hold an evangelistic meeting, call the evangelist in. Uh, How often do you have evangelistic meetings? Well, in the good old days, you'd have one Maybe one a year, maybe one every two or three years. Of course, some churches, not so much. But typically, typically a church that was evangelistically moving would have a series of meetings every year or two or three years. What would happen? The preacher would preach, the singer would sing, the appealer would appeal, and there'd be a baptism. Fantastic. And all too often, what would we see? We see some people fall away. Now, Please understand, that's just going to happen anyway. There's no surefire method of keeping in the church every last soul who is baptized. There just isn't one. Ultimately, people are free to make choices. They make a choice to follow Jesus. They make a choice to follow the church. And in some cases, they make a, church, uh, they make a choice to give it all up and, and go away. However, some fall away and we say, rightly, there shouldn't be that much recidivism Sometimes many fall away, and that becomes discouraging. And we get to the place where we say, does evangelism really work? And we say, does public evangelism really work? And that's when you get churches and church pastors and church members doing some very creative things, Uh, many times very low yield, but they say, well, that old traditional method doesn't work, so we're just gonna try this. Well, we are gonna challenge that supposition by considering an evangelism cycle, by stating flatly, public evangelism does work, evangelism does work, of course it does. So let's keep our expectations about as they ought to be, but let's look at how we can approach this intelligently. Can we do that? Farming and evangelism. It's interesting you see here a quote from volume 8 of the Testimonies, page 30. Listen to this. After sowing the seed, the husbandman is compelled to wait for months for it to germinate and develop into grain ready to be harvested. You noticed that, didn't you? wait for months. When it's agriculture, we say, that's fine. Nobody expects uh, a field full of sunflowers to just happen overnight. You say, it takes time. 
And Ellen White points this out. The husbandman waits months, is compelled to wait months. He has to, for it to develop into grain ready to be harvested. But in sowing it, he is encouraged by the expectation of fruit in the future. His labor is lightened with the hope of good returns in the time of reaping. What keeps you going? That gold. You know it's in that mountainside somewhere, so you keep chipping away at the hard rock because you're encouraged. Your labor is lightened with the hope of good returns in the time of reaping. And I'm certain you don't reap gold, but I'm using that as an example. It's what keeps you going. You know, in the spring, early spring, you're preparing the soil for your garden, if you have a garden. And you know it's going to be months before you see a return. But you do so because you're encouraged by the promise. Acts to the Apostles, page 369. There is nothing more precious in the sight of God than his ministers who go forth into the waste places of the earth to sow the seeds of truth, looking forward to the harvest. And I would add there that she is not merely referring to the ordained ministers of the gospel. When you're a, you know, when you were baptized, that was like a commissioning service for you. You were brought into the Lord's army to work for him. Your baptism, when Jesus was baptized, his earthly ministry started. And I think there's something that we've been guilty of, and that's been failing to educate people that at baptism, your ministry starts. You are a minister. Yes, so that's what she said there. None but Christ can measure the solicitude of his servants as they seek for the lost. He imparts a spirit to them, and by their efforts, souls are led to turn from sin to righteousness. Now, you may know the joy of seeing someone that you've worked with, witnessed to, accept Jesus and come to faith in Christ. But if you cannot recall that from experience, I'd like you to think about how joyous it must feel, how great it must feel to know that God used you to show Jesus to somebody and that person responded by surrendering her or his heart fully to Christ. So let's consider the seven-part farming cycle. A good farmer understands this cycle. We've divided up into seven parts. Point number one, personal preparation. You got to make sure that you are ready, that your equipment is ready, that your supplies are ready. I was recently visiting friends on a farm. And uh, they raise cattle, they fatten them up, and sell them to whoever's going to take over the process later on. That's what they do. And knowing that later they've got to have something to sell, they begin by planning to go to the sales. So they make a plan. They know that in two months, in one month, next week, there's a sale that's going to take place at a certain stockyard. Then they know what kind of calves they're going to buy. They know what they don't want. They know what kind of feed they need to have on hand for these little things when they bring them home. And so they go to the stockyard to buy calves with a checkbook in their hand and a trailer tied behind the back of the ute or the pickup so they can bring them back to the farm. Personal preparation. We do that. We understand that. Bring this over into evangelism, sharing Jesus. There needs to be personal preparation. Now, secondly, Soil preparation. If you're going to plant something, now I know that on a lot of great big farms today, they simply drill seed into the ground and they're not tilling it up. But typically, people like you and me, we're not, we're not drilling our seed into the ground. We are preparing the soil. Then there is seed sowing. The seed must get into the earth before it's going to spring up and produce anything spectacular. Then cultivation. It's in the ground. You know, I grew some great corn once. You know how come it was so good? Because I did some research. I said, what does it take to grow good corn? And what I read said, you need to make an application of nitrogen at a certain time. I thought, I don't remember my dad ever putting nitrogen on the corn. Maybe that explains some things. At the appointed time, I had the nitrogen. <laughs> I applied that nitrogen, bam, those corn stalks just took, up, up, took off upwards. Seemed to work because in cultivation, there are some things to do. 
got to take the weeds out. If you don't take the weeds out, well, we found out in the parable a few moments ago, the thorns or even the grassy weeds will grow up and choke the life out of the plant. So once the seed's in the ground, once, once somebody is showing an interest in Jesus, the work's not over. The work goes on. Then there is harvest time. Oh, we like that. And then there's harvest preservation. When I was a kid, you know, growing up, my dad grew pumpkins. These things were prolific. You just put the seed in the ground, frankly, and, and, and got out of their way. Because they grew and they produced wonderfully. And then those pumpkins were going to last us all year, all the way through the winter. My dad had a place in the shed. He'd take the pumpkins. He'd set them up there. They'd sit there. Months later, if we wanted the pumpkin, we'd go out to the shed. We'd get one down. We'd cut that thing open. Mmm, very good. Preserving the harvest is important. You wouldn't take pumpkins and just leave them in the field. You wouldn't have them fend for themselves. You wouldn't stack them up on the back lawn out in the weather. You wouldn't do that. Things would ruin. You know something? It's often how we treat the harvest of the Lord that dictates that much of that harvest will ruin. Thinking about it, you got to simply change a whole lot. And then, number seven, repeat the cycle. Repeat the cycle. You've driven past corn fields or onion fields or soybean fields or milo fields or something like that. Year after year after year after year, those crops just spring up. There may be some rotation, but the farmer plans to do it again and again and again and again, and that's just how you do it. It's the right way to do it. So that's the seven-part farming cycle. A good soul winner understands that cycle as well, all seven parts. And you'll notice that evangelistic meetings are part of the cycle. If we can get out of our minds that the evangelistic meeting is the cycle, and we can simply start to plan and to work effectively, utilizing the meeting as part of an overall cycle, we're going to be a whole lot better off, and we will see returns increase dramatically. Now, let me say this. I know that there's a good chance that you're going to say, oh, I'm familiar with this. Uh, we plan, we strategize, we have a cycle. Fantastic. Listen on, and you'll find some things that will enhance what you are doing. If this is new to you, this will revolutionize your outreach. It simply will. So I'd like you to consider this. We'll consider it in some detail, of course. Uh, and this is the evangelism cycle on a chart. Now, as we drill down, here's what we find. Point number one, personal preparation. What would that be? Spending time with God. Honest to goodness, I'm convinced, convicted, I believe, that we collectively just don't spend enough time on getting ourselves right with God so that God can use us. My friend Pastor Dave woke up at 2 o'clock in the morning and he felt a strong impression. Pray for this certain individual. It's a great story which led to the individual coming to faith in Christ and becoming part of God's church. But the reason Pastor Dave felt impressed to pray for this man, which happened to be at exactly the same time as the man was having an impressive dream that God gave to him was that Pastor Dave was in tune with God. And so when God said, Dave, I want you to pray, he knew what to do. He got out of his bed and he went and knelt down in the living room so as not to disturb his family. And he prayed his heart out and the result was truly miraculous and astonishing. Personal preparation, being in a place where God can use you effectively. Spend time with God. I recommend some reading to you. Read the book of Acts. See what God did to grow the, to grow the church, and the miracle working power of God. Read the book Acts of the Apostles, the book Evangelism, the book Christian Service. These books will speak to you. They will fire you up. If you haven't read Evangelism or Christian Service, or if you haven't read them in a while, read them. You, you, they'll set you on fire. They're amazing books. And you'll come away with a real enthusiasm for sharing your faith in Jesus Christ. You know, the disciples, they spent time anticipating 
the Holy Spirit, the early rain. They spent 10 days in the upper room searching their hearts, being sure that they were right with Christ, ready to receive the Holy Spirit. And consequently, when the Spirit fell on them, they were open to receive the Holy Spirit. Now, do not think that that God gives the Spirit begrudgingly to you. He just wants you to be open. And if you will prepare yourself and put you in the place where God can bless you, you will see God start to do great things. Imagine this. Let's isolate a couple of these points. What if everybody in the church simply said, God, here I am, use me. And that's all they did. If we spent no more time talking about how to effectively do evangelism, but everyone in the church said, I'm willing to be used, so use me. That would revolutionize the church. I mean, without learning a few more things, you might fumble a few times. But just imagine, what would your church look like if everyone prayed, here am I, send me. If everyone said, today, Lord, before I go outside, I'm asking you to bring someone to me that I can share Jesus with. When did your church last get together and pray that God would grow the church. Doesn't happen very often. I'll tell you what, I shouldn't, but I will. Great story. A church with four people attending. Uh, it, was, it was a dying church, literally. A uh, physician and his wife and a couple of others, and they just said, the church is about to close. Yet it doesn't need to. There are people around here we could win. They said, we don't know what to do. So we will pray and ask God to help us. True story. And they just prayed and they prayed and they prayed and they spent time with God. Somebody comes to see the doctor and says, Doc, you're a Christian, aren't you? Yes, I am. Would you tell me what it takes to become a Christian? His wife is in the supermarket and somebody walks up and says, aren't you a Seventh-day Adventist? Yes, I am. I've always wanted to know what Seventh-day Adventists believe. Would you teach me? This started happening. Again and again and again. I'll tell you how the story ends. They needed a baptistry. The church didn't have one. They needed to buy a little kind of a mobile baptistry so they could do baptisms in the church because they started having Bible studies with people who were just coming out of the woodwork. They got online. I guess they went to Baptistries R Us or Baptistries.com or something, and they ordered the baptistry from quite a long way away. A man delivered the baptistry to them. He said, what is this thing anyway? They explained. He said, how about that? Well, they spotted an opening. And when he went home, he went home with some Bible studies and they started studying the Bible together with this man from a distance. It was a number of months later and that man got back in his vehicle, drove to that church and was baptized in the baptistry that he delivered to the church. Isn't that great? Can you say amen? Amen. Great story. Here were people who didn't know what they didn't know. They came to God and they said, we want to be right with you and we want you to use us. If we just pray that God will use The church went from four in attendance to 16 baptized members in attendance. And you might think, oh, 16 is not a very big church. That's 300% growth. And if your church had 300% growth, I think you'd be kind of happy, wouldn't you? I think you would. I would encourage you to, to organize an evangelism team to pray with. I want you to overcomplicate that. Just find, if, if, it, if it's just you, grab people. If it's you and your spouse or you and a friend, get others. Find people within the church. The pastor will help you. The pastor will be enthusiastic about evangelistic activity in the church. So get a group of people together that you can work on as a team, or that you can work with as a team rather. Pray together, study together, plan together, strategize together. All right. Point number two, and that is soil preparation. You've prepared yourself. You've come to God. You've said, here I am. Send me. Use me for your glory. What do we do next? Well, what would you do if you were planting a garden? You'd prepare the soil. You'd prepare the soil. See, later, you want, somebody, you, you want to come to somebody and say, will you accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior? In some way, you're going to say that to them somehow, but not right away. You want to prepare the soil by 
connecting with people. How do you connect with people? Well, as a church, you could, you, well, I'll tell you this first. You are limited only by your imagination. That's it. There's a thousand things that you could do. You could conduct health seminars, stop smoking programs, cooking classes, diabetes reversal. We do that well. We've got health programs from here to there. Health programs. This is a way for you to get in touch with people, to get in touch with people that you otherwise might not get in touch with. Now, I'll tell you this. You could, you could, you could find people to share Jesus with by simply walking up to people on the street and saying, would you like me to share Jesus with you? Someone's going to say yes, but I think for the vast majority of people, it's a little abrupt and a little too much too soon. So we want to make friends for Christ. We want to show ourselves friendly. You've heard the quote from Ministry of Healing, page 143. Christ's method alone will bring true success in reaching the people. She writes, he mingled among men as one who desired their good, ministered to their needs, won their confidence, and then he bade them follow me. Mingled among men as one who desired their good. This is what we're doing here. And we're ministering to their needs. Health seminars. Recovery programs, you can do grief recovery, divorce recovery, you can do some kind of addiction recovery programs. And trust me, there are people in your community dealing with grief and divorce and addiction. It's just there. Now, you may need to find an expert to do some of this. You may get a pre-recorded video program to do this. You might just do it. Uh, I wouldn't advocate you start to do anything medical that you shouldn't do. Um, I think you would recognize that as well. Share a story with you. I was on the pastoral staff of a church where an older fella uh, suffered a tremendous loss. His wife died. And when we saw him, my goodness, it looked like he was going to die too. He hadn't been in good health. The shock was immense. He was like a dead man walking. And so the church member got around him but he realized that if he didn't do something, he'd die. So he prayed to God, Lord, give me a ministry. Help me by allowing me to help others. He thought, just a moment, I'm dealing with grief and there are so many people like me. He began a grief support group. He hadn't had any training in this. He's an educated man, but he wasn't an expert in this. So he got resources and he started to read and study and figure out how this ought to happen. But what he did basically was let people know it was happening, called people together. There were plenty of grieving people in the community. They shared their experience and they supported each other. You know, it wasn't long and this man came back to life, back to life. There was another benefit too that came from uh, this, this story. He needed help. He needed secretarial help. And he knew there was a woman in the community uh, who had just the skills that he needed. And he said, would you mind helping me? And so she helped and they got working together and they got talking together and I attended their wedding. They got married together. So out of that service for others came um, many blessings, great blessings. Do recovery programs, special church events, Christmas, Easter, invite the community, invite your friends. You know something, my friend, if the church kids are doing special music, you can say to your neighbor, if your neighbor is wired this way, hey, our church kids are doing a special thing at church this weekend. It's going to be great. Why don't you come? Let me ask you this. I'm digressing ever so slightly. Let me ask you this. How many people in your church right now do you think are inviting people to church? Just that. Inviting people to church. My guess is typically not many. If your church bucks that trend well hallelujah we thank god for it very recently an old atheist friend of mine told me that his aunt got on the phone and said john is preaching in your neighborhood would you like to go with me and listen and he said i'd love to except i'm working so i'm going to plan for next time and try and be there isn't that great an invitation she invited her atheist nephew now she she knew that the atheist and i were friends and had been for almost Oh my goodness, for almost 40 years, almost 40 years. You can't believe that, I know. Uh, so there was that.
but use what you've got. Your neighbor knows your grandchild and says, hey, my grandchild, Bobby, is going to be doing some music at church. Why don't you come? I assure you. Oh, I love Bobby. You know what I'm saying? Use what you've got to get people through the door and into church. Or, if not into church, to your church meeting or your church-sponsored event. Now, you'll notice at the bottom of this slide, it says, build an interest list. You need to, to write those words down and remember them. I spoke to somebody who said, oh, we had this fabulous Christmas program. People came out. We packed the church. They loved it. I said, who were these people? Oh, people from the community. Great. Are you going to invite them to the next event? Well, that's when the eyebrows started to kind of furrow a little bit. I said, do you have a list of those people's names and contact details? Oh, we didn't think of that. Well, think of it now. And, 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 and for goodness sake, don't forget to build an interest list. Somebody, somebody comes to your church. You have them sign in for the program. If it's church, it's, it, that's a little different. Have them fill out the visitor book. Do whatever you've got to do. If they come to your health-related seminar, you tell them, we, we want to do a registration here and find out who's here and, and get your contact details. You, you, everywhere you go, you register for stuff. You expect that. People will expect that. And then what you've got is you send a letter to the people coming to your diabetes recovery seminar. And say, thanks for coming. See you next week. Pretty simple. When it's over, we're glad you were a part of it. Here's this resource, perhaps. A month later, we'd like you to come out to our weight loss program or to our smoking cessation program or our depression program or whatever. So now you have an interest list and you can build on that in an appropriate way. There's something else that I would recommend uh, that you do. It's really easy. Let's say you're having a stop smoking program. It could be anything at all. And people have been coming up for five nights or five weeks or whatever it might be. What I'd do is I'd give everybody a piece of paper or a clipboard or something, but uh, their own personal form to fill out. And I'd say, okay, you've got this form. Uh, it's really been great having you at Central Church, First Church, City Church. So glad you've been here. We want you to know that we have a whole heap of services that we offer here at this church. You know we do health, and I want you to notice here, you've come to the X seminar. We also offer W, Y, and Z, or even Z, depending you know, how, you, how you do it. If you'd like to come to those, just, just put a check mark right next to that. In addition, we do archaeology, we do uh, child rearing, we do whatever it is you do or are planning to do. You can even say, and we have a, a kind of a Boy Scouts program, Boy and Girl Scouts program for kids called Pathfinders. We have one for adventurers. If you'd like to know more about that, let us know. See, by now you've made friends with people. They like you and they trust you. And they're interested in what else you have going on. And you can say, and if you'd like to know more about the Bible, this is a church after all, we major in that, let us know. We have some Bible studies that we, we could offer you with, and you may even say, we've got these wonderful letters written Bible study guides, or we have DVDs, or we have X, Y, Z. Uh, and if you are no pressure about it, and you are casual and straight up about it, people are happy to do that. Oh, that was nice of them. They told me what else they have going on here. And no one who comes to a church is going to be shocked or offended by you offering them Bible studies if you do it right. It's a church after all. So build an interest list. Very, very important. So that's soil preparation. Now we're looking at seed sowing. Now that you, as a matter of fact, part of what I just described was seed sowing as well. But here's how you can go about seed sowing. At It Is Written, we have something we call the Mega Mailer. It has been phenomenally successful. It's a Bible study interest card. You mail it out to your community, and people who want Bible studies mail it back saying, yes, please study the Bible with me. How about that? To have somebody send something back to you in the mail that says, yes, I want you to study the Bible. Now, if you mail those out, you can expect to get, ordinarily, about one per thousand back. I know you're thinking that's not much, but if you mail 10,000, 
You've got 10 people saying, I want you to study the Bible with me. That's pretty good. Uh, a good return might be two per thousand. And my friend, Pastor Tom in California said that if you get three per thousand, he said, he said this, he said, that's hallelujah. That's how he put it. After we've mailed out a million of these mega mailer cards, we are now averaging 10 per thousand. Uh, in the wine country of Central California, four point something per thousand. That's, that's shocking. Uh, in some places, 30 per thousand. Clearly in some places, a little less because places are places. Places differ. But how about that? If you got 10 per thousand and you mailed out 20,000, that's, that's 200 Bible interests going on the averages now that now your church gets to follow up. That's pretty good. And they're not expensive. So check with us at It Is Written if you'd like to know about that. You could arrange for It Is Written to be aired on your local TV network or radio station. That's easy. If you have a public access channel, they're crying out for content. Get It Is Written placed. It's, uh, it's really well worth doing. You go to a radio station and say, we've got these programs that are just so good. Would you, would you check them out and run It Is Written on the radio? Uh, many will say yes. Social media campaign. Have people listen to the every word or watch the every word devotional that I do every day, 60 seconds from the Bible. You can get Bible study signups by social media campaign. And those things are easy. You can distribute tracts such as Glow Tracts or It Is Written DVD sharing cards. You give people these little cards, they just scan them or type in the very short URL. They can watch uh, It Is Written broadcasts, which will lead them deeper into a, a stronger desire for spiritual truth. Seed sowing. You and I both know there are lots of ways you could do this. And soil preparation. I didn't even hardly scratch the surface. You know, there's a lot of things that you could do. Well, then we get to cultivation. You've prepared yourself. You've prepared the soil. You have sown the seed. And now we cultivate. We work with it. We respond to Bible study interests and begin sharing Bible studies. We start to conduct Bible studies, whether they're in, persons, in a person's home or Bible studies that you drop off personally. You start to conduct, or maybe you continue to conduct, health programs and recovery programs. You do your bridge building events, concerts, health fairs, archaeology seminars, and that sort of thing. You're cultivating now. And you're starting to funnel people towards the study of the Bible. Now, there'll be some people that you reach out to and they're all closed off. They don't want to study the Bible. That's fine. Keep working with them anyway. Invite them to church events. Maintain a friendship. Get them involved, particularly in the more secular aspects of uh, church outreach and church events. And keep graciously and gently offering, knowing that perhaps in the future that no is going to turn into a yes. And then the harvest. Now, we do this well. But without cultivating and seed sowing and soil preparation and personal preparation, the harvest is going to be severely compromised. Evangelist meetings are still effective. You know how I know that? Because I do them. And I see results. And I hear about others doing them and they're getting results. So if somebody says to you, evangelistic meetings don't work, then you've got something to resolve in your mind because they work for us and many others. But when do they work best? They're not going to work if all you do is the evangelistic meetings, at least not nearly as much as you hope. If you just do the meeting, you'll win some, but not nearly as many as if you really treat this with the respect it deserves. You could hold a two-week meeting, a three-week meeting, a four-week meeting. I would say the longer the better. If you're holding a very short meeting, then my goodness, that's just a reaping series. That's okay if that's what it is, but you've got to have something to reap. If you've put a lot of work in on the front end and you've got people who've been studying the Bible and making decisions, they've started to attend church and now they just need some encouragement to make a full surrender to Jesus, two weeks might be absolutely perfect. Uh, but four-week meetings, they're okay. They still work. Now, does everybody have four weeks? No, no, they don't. Uh, some people are very busy. But again, please don't think that you're ever going to find one method that works for everyone. You're just not. 
The larger the group that you get out, the better decision rate you're going to get. If you have an evangelistic series and you're preaching to five people, that's one thing. If you can get 500 or 100 or 50, that's a whole lot better. You can have an evangelistic meeting in a public hall. Um, you can have it at the church, of course. You can have it at home. Wherever you have the meeting, please keep in mind the dynamics associated with that location. If it's a hall, make it a good hall, a hall that people actually want to go to. Make sure people can find it. Make sure there's adequate parking. If it's the church, same. Make sure people can find it. Make sure there's good parking. Make sure your church looks like the kind of building people want to come into. Cut the grass. Paint the doorway with all of its flaky paint on there. If you need some more uh, carpet in the hallway, get it. If you can't afford it, put down a rug. Do something. Uh, so keep in mind the dynamics, but you can hold that meeting in a variety of places. And then there's a harvest. You, you, you call for decisions. You get decisions. There are people who are baptized. And let's say there's a group this big who come into your church. Where does the emphasis now have to be? It has to be on keeping these people. Keeping them. Too often we lose people because folks join the church and we just don't have anything to do with them. We forget all about them. We put no effort into actually keeping them. And that's a great pity. You spend a lot of money on an evangelistic series and often little or nothing on keeping people in the church. And that's, that's too bad. You forget people who come into the church, they are going to get the message from you. I have been forgotten. So before long, most people who are forgotten by the church will forget about the church. You know, someone who's baptized is a baby, a baby Christian. And would you consider with me, please, that babies take some work. They've got to be cleaned and fed and assisted with things that you and I would think are pretty basic. They, uh, they can't always fend for themselves. They don't always recognize danger. Babies. But what do we do with babies? We love them. We nurture them, we support them, we provide a good environment for them, and we help them to grow. Keep in mind that environment. When you have new folks come into the church, you, you, you want to shut the back door of the church just as firmly as you can. Can it be done? Oh, yes, it can. We were in uh, Gweru, Zimbabwe, not that long ago, 650 people baptized. Six weeks later, they had a meeting for those people, and 647 of them showed up might have been that the other three were out of town. 647 out of 650, that's pretty good. You are going to say, oh, but that's Zimbabwe, that's not here. That's true. I'll tell you how that's Zimbabwe, it really is. The gentleman who was coordinating the site where I was preaching told me that uh, the meeting attendance will increase as the nights went by. I said, how can you be so sure? He said, because we have people going out into the community simply doing nothing but inviting people to come. I said, well, how many people do you have going out? He said, 30. We said, we have 32. And in my heart, I said, praise the Lord, they have 32 people going out. And he, then he carried on and said, teams of three. 96 people going out into the community, doing nothing but inviting people to the meetings. If you had 96 people, in your city or town, inviting people to come out to meetings. Do you think it would make a difference? It made a difference where we were. It would make a difference where you are as well. Anyhow, we need to shut the back door. You know, when you bring a baby into the home, you've got to be quiet around that baby at the right times. You want to treat that baby with kindness even when they mess up. You don't want to yell at a child. You'll scar a child if you yell at that child and lose your temper. You don't want to be violent with that child. Of course, that's entirely inappropriate. Babies in Christ need nurturing. We've got to help them understand what it means to be a church member. Help them understand what it means to be a disciple. I would use those terms interchangeably. Understand what it means to be a follower of Jesus. Help that new person know what it means to keep the Sabbath. Show them. Help them make friends with people inside the church by letting them make a friend of you. And you know something? <clears throat> you can cross the generations for this. My friend turned up to an evangelistic meeting once. They said, how do you find out about it? He said, the billboard. They said, but there's no billboard. So that's interesting. And after he was baptized, an elderly couple invited them home. 
This young man in his early 20s with his long hair, a, a, a hippie of kinds he had been, every week they invited him home. Every week he loved them and they loved him. And it was that relationship that really anchored him in faith in Christ. So we want to preserve the church members. There's a lot more that we could say, and perhaps later we will, but this isn't the forum for that. But you've got to work at preserving the harvest, integrating people into the life of the church, helping them to make friends, helping them to find a purpose, getting them involved in ministry. That's really important. So we'll learn to shut the back door. And then point number seven, repeat the cycle. Do it again. You know something? I conducted a series of meetings in a place. We had a great result. Really God blessed because of the wonderful work that the church members had done as the Bible worker helped them to get involved in outreach. And he really led the charge. Well, when my series was over, I was leaving the town. It was told to me that the Bible worker would conduct the next series of meetings. So what he did was this. Most of the people baptized went into a Sabbath school class that he taught. So for 10 weeks, he taught them principles of spiritual growth. After that, he just segued right into a discipleship training class. They didn't know it was different. They thought that's what everyone at that church did. He was teaching them how to share their faith. He used them as the Bible workers for the next series of meetings. And this rookie evangelist, a Bible worker who'd never conducted a series of meetings in his life, had a profoundly successful series of meetings because he knew that the key to success in evangelism wasn't just the meeting, as important as that is, but the work that takes place in the build-up. Those newly baptized people have a circle of influence, family and friends that they can share their faith with. And if you teach them to model their faith correctly, their family and friends are looking at them and they're saying, wow, this Christianity thing has really helped you. And they're starting to think that they might need that Christianity thing as well. A farmer does not stop after a good cycle. You do it again. And the more you do it, the better you get at it. A good farmer is someone who has learned from failures, who has honed her or his skills, who has found principles that work and kept on using those principles, who wasn't repelled by the effort that farming takes. If you'll uh, approach sharing your faith in Jesus along those same lines, you are going to see God do really, really great things. Now, I want to take a moment and talk to you about preparing yourself for evangelism. We spoke about that earlier, but it's really important to have a heart prepared for ministry. Now, listen to this. David said, purge me with hyssop and I shall be clean. Wash me and I shall be whiter than snow. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right or a steadfast spirit within me. That's Psalm 51. And you notice something when it comes to preparing yourself for evangelism. David understood this principle well. He knew that only God could create in him a clean heart. He recognized his corruption and his need, but he knew that God could do something about it. Later in Psalm 51, verses 11 and 12, Cast me not away from thy presence, and take not thy Holy Spirit from me. Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation, and uphold me with your free or your generous spirit. Uh, Lord, make me what I cannot make myself, and then keep me. Uh, uphold me through your Spirit so freely given. This psalm is a psalm of repentance, isn't it, Psalm 51? But look where it goes. Where does David, David has created me a clean heart, purge me with hyssop, forgive me, cleanse me. Why? Verse 13, then I will teach transgressors your ways and a multitude of sinners or sinners shall be converted to you. David wanted a new heart for himself so that he could lead others into a new heart experience with God. Uh, repentance for David reconversion for David wasn't just a selfish matter. He knew if I get right with God, God can use me to lead others to himself. Paul wrote to the Galatians and he said, I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me 
and gave himself for me. What you want to experience is righteousness by faith. When Jesus comes into your heart by faith, he brings his righteousness into your life and begins to live his life out in you. And you want that experience. You can have that experience. Philippians 4 and verse 13, I can do all things through Christ, which strengtheneth me. Now, you might be thinking about your lack, your sin, your sinfulness, your weakness, your your failures. Don't. Instead, think about Jesus and his goodness and his greatness and his power. You figured out you're a sinner? Well, congratulations. Welcome to the human family. Now you want to figure out that Jesus can come into your life and obscure, take away your sins, hide them, so that only Jesus will be seen. You take an old rusty nail, jam it into a wall, put a beautiful picture on that old rusty nail. No one sees the rusty nail. They see the beautiful picture. Your heart might be like that rusty nail, broken and challenged and compromised. But when Jesus comes into your life, that rustiness isn't seen and Jesus is seen. God can change anyone. He changed David, who was an adulterer and a liar and a murderer and at times faithless. He changed the woman at the well. What an experience she had. Jesus didn't condemn. By the way, you don't have people coming to your church that you're condemning, do you? They come in smelling like smoke. Love them. God bless them. They come in drunk. Love them. Um, Watch them too, for that matter, but love them. They come in with questionable morals. Love them. You know, I was pastoring a church before I got there. I think it's important that I add that. There's a fellow who'd come to church with his wife. He was not a church member. He would bring cocaine with him to church. Halfway through the sermon, he'd get up, he'd go out to the men's room, and he'd sniff a line of cocaine up his nose. He'd come back and take a seat by his wife and was surprised at how much better the pastor's preaching had gotten. One day he's listening to that same pastor. He gets up. It's time to go and snort cocaine. He goes out to the bathroom. He lines up his cocaine. He says, what am I doing? He sweeps it into the sink, empties the bag into the sink, runs water and runs it down the drain, throws the bag in the trash. He never did it again. Somebody in the church, if they knew he had a drug problem, might have railed against him and said, we've got to get that guy out of here. Uh, You understand what I mean. I'm not saying let everything go. I don't want to get into that. What I'm saying is God can change anyone. And if you don't have anyone at your church smelling of smoke, it's probably because your church isn't doing its job. You're reaching out to the lost. You ought to get somebody bringing their baggage to church. And we know that God can save them. Jesus didn't condemn the woman at the well. He showed love and mercy. The first missionary in the Bible was a man who was demon-possessed, of course, before he became a missionary. Zacchaeus was a thief, an an unjust, dishonest man. Jesus changed his heart. Peter, changed by Jesus. If Jesus can change them, he can change you. He doesn't do it against your will. Too many people have the idea that in order to come to God, they've got to kind of be perfect or get stuff out of their life. In order to come to God, Really, all you need to be is willing, willing to surrender. And even if you don't think you can, God, I don't know how I can surrender X to you. Just tell him I'm willing. The truth is we can't give God our heart anyway. We can only consent for him to take it. The problem many of us have is we're hanging on to our own heart and not letting Jesus have it. So if you are willing to be connected to Jesus, you'll be connected to Jesus. And then fruit will be produced in your life. Look at this. Jesus said in John 15 verse 1, I am the true vine and my father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that bears fruit, he prunes that it may bear more fruit. Verse 3, you're already clean because of the word which I have spoken to you. Abide in me and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit. For without me, that is outside of me, you can do how much? Nothing. 
Without me, you can do nothing. So we see several, in fact, four fruit production levels. There's no fruit in verse 2. And the result, the branches are thrown away. Why? Because they're not connected to Jesus. Then there is some fruit. And what Jesus does then is he trims and cleans up the vine. Then there's more fruit. And then there's one with lots of fruit. Jesus joined to us and us joined to Jesus. That's the key. Personal preparation, entering into a relationship with Jesus, isn't about you cleaning up you. You can't do that. Isn't about you fixing everything that's wrong. You can't do that. God can. You can cooperate. God will say, take that movie sitting on the shelf of your entertainment system, that movie of very questionable content, throw it in a trash. You've been sitting there looking at it thinking, oh man, I should probably get rid of that. God says, go do it. You go, oh Lord, that's tough. God will give you the strength. You put it in the trash. Take it out of the curb. Drop it off in a dumpster somewhere else so you're not threatened to go, no, uh, tempted to go and get it. Joined to Jesus is absolutely the key. You know, there was a British pastor, a man named F.B. Mayer. And he was convinced that the power of God that should be in his life was not. He recognized that. His ministry wasn't having the success that he wished. And so he, he prayed much about it, asked God for help. So one day he had a dream in which it seemed that Jesus came to him and said, Mayer, Give me the keys to your heart. And so in his dream, he handed over a bunch of keys. But Jesus said, Mayor, are these all the keys? And in that dream, he remembered that there was one more key yet, a key to a very small drawer. He hadn't given it over. And Jesus said, I want all the keys to your heart. In his dream, he went through a struggle for self-surrender, not partial surrender, but complete surrender. He struggled with it. And after a little struggling, he handed over that key to Jesus. He wrote later and he said that was absolutely the turning point in his life, the decision to surrender fully to Jesus. And that's where many of us struggle. We surrender some, a little, maybe a lot, but not all. Don't misunderstand me. I'm not saying we fix a lot, but not all. We can't fix anything. It's God who does the fixing. We do the surrendering, the cooperating as the Spirit moves us. Some of us, we've got to give another key to God, maybe several keys we're holding back. We want to be surrendered to God and see the Holy Spirit go to work cleansing our hearts and changing our lives. Prophets and Kings, page 233. Transformation of character is the testimony to the world of an indwelling, of, of an indwelling Christ. The Spirit of God produces a new life in the soul, bringing the thoughts and desires into obedience to the will of Christ. And the inward man is renewed in the image of God. Councils on Health, page 561. The Holy Spirit seeks to abide in each soul. If it is welcomed as an honored guest, those who receive it will be made complete in Christ. The good work begun will be finished. The holy thoughts, heavenly affections, and Christ-like actions will take the place of impure thoughts, perverse sentiments, and rebellious acts. Paul wrote to the Philippians, he said, he who has begun a good work in you is faithful to perform it until the day of Christ. He wrote again to the Philippians in the next chapter, chapter 2, and he said, it is God which worketh in you both to will and to do for his good pleasure. So if you let God do the work he wants to do, God will do the work he wants to do. It'll be powerful. You'll never be the same. And God will be able to use you in an amazing way. Young man came to the foreman of a logging crew. He said, I'd like a job. The 
foreman said, can you cut down a tree? Yes, I can. He said, go ahead, let me, cut you. Let me, let me see you cut down that tree. And so the young man did with his ax, cut down a tree, did it very well. The foreman said, you are hired. And he, and he, and he started on with that crew, I, I believe it was that very day. Uh, so he worked Monday and Tuesday and Wednesday. And, and then Thursday, the foreman approached the young man and he said, you can, you can pick up your check on the way out. He said, wait, I thought payday was Friday, tomorrow, Friday. And he said, yes, normally, but I'm letting you go because you're falling behind. He had been first place cutting down trees Monday, last place Thursday, that foreman wasn't a dummy, he recognized the young man was wilting, no point in having him on. The young man said, but wait, I work hard. I'm the first to get here in the morning, I'm the last to leave in the evening. I've even been working through my breaks. The foreman thought about it, he said, there's a problem here, this young man really does work hard, he does have integrity, but he's falling behind. He said to him, have you been sharpening your ax young man said, sharpen my axe? Who has time for that? I've been too busy. I've been too busy to sharpen my axe. Our lives can be like that, you know. We can get so busy, we get to keep the axe sharp. We get to keep in close contact with Jesus. Let this be your lifestyle. Connection with Jesus. You in Christ and Christ in you. When you give your heart to Jesus Christ, he fills you with his presence. He makes you what you cannot make yourself. You have his righteousness. His power will be at work in your life. And you'll also want to work for the salvation of others. You'll see God do truly amazing things in you and through you. And it is written, <clears throat> we know that you can be an effective soul winner. We know because we've seen it that your church can be transformed formed into a soul-winning center. If you follow an evangelism cycle, and simply let God work through you to reach others, you'll see a great return on your investment of time and talents and energies. You just will. So how is it with you? Are you crying out to God, asking God to do in you the work that only He can do? I hope and pray that you are. As you do, just watch God work in amazing ways. You want to stay connected to Jesus? Read God's word and seek his will for your life. It would help you to keep a diary of what God is trying to tell you. Pray using God's model. In Matthew chapter 6 in the Lord's Prayer, our Father in heaven, you come to God as Father. Talk to one who loves you infinitely. Hallowed be thy name. Recognize who he is. He is holy. You can even mention some of God's names as you pray and connect with him. Thy kingdom come. You're, you're pleading for his return. You're looking forward to the return of Jesus, like John who wrote Revelation and ended off by saying, even so, come Lord Jesus. You're praying God's will will be done. That's surrender. Lord, not my will, but yours. Lord, your will be done. Give us this day our daily bread. Take time to tell God about what you need and what you want, knowing that my God shall supply all your needs according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. And forgive us our debts. Confess your sins and ask God for forgiveness as we forgive our debtors. Jesus was clear. If you're not willing to forgive others, God won't forgive you. Forgiveness is vital and it's also measurably good for your health. That's just the truth. Then lead us not into temptation. Ask for guidance to make wise decisions even in small matters and expect God's power to work in your life to keep you from falling into temptation and being taken by it. But deliver us from the evil one. Expect God's power to deliver you. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. End with praise. End with praise. Use the Lord's Prayer to pray. Well, fantastic. Thank you for your time. Our next session is going to be Wonderful. I'd like to introduce you to the presenter of the next session. He's my friend and associate speaker at It Is Written. His name is Eric Flickinger. Eric, why don't you come and share a little bit about what you're going to be discussing in this next session? What's 
the subject for discussion. Fantastic. We have an incredible session coming up. The very next one that we're going to be looking at is how to set up a vibrant Bible school in your community. This time we looked at the overall scope of evangelism, the cycle of evangelism, and how you yourself can get prepared for the work that God is calling you to do. Now, how do you find people to study the Bible with? How do you find the people who are out there who are longing to know more about Jesus? That's what we're going to look at in this next segment. But between now and then, I want to encourage you to check out a resource that will, that will benefit you incredibly. And that is something called SALT 365. John, you made mention of building an evangelism team. That's one of the key elements in getting the evangelism ball rolling in your church. If you go to saltevangelism.com, saltevangelism.com, and click on the SALT 365 link, you will find a video on how to build an evangelism team in your church, and that will help you get prepared for our next studies that we're going to do together. And keep in mind, there at SALT 365, there, there are dozens of training videos that you can watch in, in just minutes for each one, and they will really enhance your personal outreach and the outreach of your church. It's a great resource, saltevangelism.com, and uh, enjoy the SALT 365 programs. They have been designed to be a blessing to you as you share Jesus with others. Let's pray together just now. Father in heaven, we've been encouraged by what we have heard. Bless us and use us for your glory. Use us in reaching others for your kingdom. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.